This year is INN's first year having sponsors for our conference, and we're glad to have the support of organizations like Microsoft to make the conference stronger and to enable us to put this conference together. We're thankful for their support for INN and for the field and for the conversation they're going to have here today. Initially, INN and Microsoft planned a conversation around how Microsoft could better support news organizations. And that's an important conversation that we're going to help Microsoft have with you in the weeks and months to come. Stay tuned to our newsletters for announcements about that or sign up for updates by clicking the link that we'll be putting in the chat here shortly. Um, instead of that session though, Microsoft has decided that there's a more important conversation to be had and is turning their session over to some of our colleagues. Our hope is that this session will give you all a chance to listen to and better understand the experience of, of black journalists and other journalists of color. There will also be opportunities for you to participate via the chat as well, and we hope you do. Uh, joining us will be talented journalists from across the media field. They're entrepreneurs, founders, reporters, and producers. Uh, I know many of their, their work, and I've attended sessions with several of them before as well. I always, always leave with a new perspective or a better understanding of something important. So I'm glad to have them here today. I hope you, you'll join me in listening to our colleagues who have lived with the effects of systemic racism in our world and in our field and think about the role we all play in creating a world and an industry that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. With that, I'm gonna turn the session over to our colleague, Joaquin Alvarado, who will introduce the panelists. Joaquin, take it away. Uh, thanks uh, for that, Jonathan, and, and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I wanna just provide a little context because I think it's important. Um, and we are in, I'm in Seattle right now, so you may have heard about the autonomous zone that's been established here. Um, so this is a bit of an autonomous conversation in the sense that um, as we were planning for what we were originally going to do, um, it dawned on all of us that um, there's a more uh, pressing um, uh, dialogue that we need to help create space for. So this is a, a manifestation of, of folks stepping back and thank you to the whole team at Microsoft for their support in this. Um, and I wanna shout out to Eric uh, Mary, uh, Ben, Vera, Dom, the entire group there was very supportive of um, really seeding some space so that we could bring in um, something rather quickly. And I'll thank my panelists in advance for making themselves available. Um, but I also want to note that these are relationships that go back many years. So everybody who's represented here is connected to work that I personally am, am connected and, and have followed but also are connected to each other in important ways. And um, when taken as a whole, I, I think provide a platform for understanding the moment we're in and what our shared responsibilities are. Um, and I think we also have to be honest about where we have not um, done enough, or in some cases we've actually done harm in terms of providing um, the resources and the support and the will um, to really stand up for uh, black journalists and other journalists of color um, and if you grew up in, in communities of color, you're not surprised by the place that the country is right now. Um, issues around policing, around systemic racism, and around a lack of access to resources are um, centuries old in this country. So whether you're Latino, you're African American, you're Native American, you're Asian American, Pacific Islander, um, your American experience is, is written in to that institutionalized racism. So. Um, we're not going to deconstruct it all here, um, but making space for these dialogues and conversations is essential. And holding ourselves accountable for going faster and being more effective about serving our communities and providing resources and uh, jobs. It's that simple for uh, diverse journalists. So I'm going to help manage the introductions. Um, Aliyah Wright, who's a fabulous and amazing young reporter at Mississippi Today, is going to actually drive the dialogue and facilitate the dialogue. Um, we may scan and take some questions, but really want to create space for these, um, these important leaders to kind of share their thoughts. So, uh, so I'll kind of quarterback here on the introductions. I want to start with Aaliyah Wright, introducing yourself, Aaliyah, please. Um, and then we'll move on from there to, uh, to Tracy. But Aaliyah, take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, it's so good to see that there's literally over 100 people right now. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Aaliyah. I am from the Mississippi Delta and I cover education and all things Delta for Mississippi Today. And we're a nonprofit digital newsroom and we cover everything literally. Uh, aside from me being a full-time journalist at Mississippi Today, 
I co-host a weekly radio segment at the local radio station here, WROX. Um, I am a playwright and fellow for StoryWorks, which is a nonprofit theater initiative where we turn journalism into theatrical productions. Um, and I'm also a host of other things, uh, but I'll leave it there. Great, and I'd like to pass it to Tracy to introduce yourself. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I'm Tracy Powell. I am the program officer of the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund with Borealis Philanthropy. Um, I've been a journalist, started out um, actually on the business side of, new of newspapers as a circulation manager and in, in, in advertising sales. Um, I left after a few years and went to cover COP um, and eventually government before kind of launching my own a couple of publications and also running a black newspaper um, in Dallas, Texas. Um, after that, I started working with Pointer and trying to help journalists kind of understand the changing media landscape and entrepreneurial journalism. And now I invest in, um, in journalism entrepreneurs, so I've come full circle and I'm really excited to be here. And thank you again for including me. Yeah, and I want to just uh, underscore that Tracy probably has the broadest experience of anybody I know. And, and the fact that you also have control of some resources now, Tracy, is I think something we'll want to dig into a little bit if you're good with that. Um, I'm going to turn next to Jennifer, uh, who is the, the new-ish executive director at 826 <laughs> Chicago. Um, and, and before we get you started, Jennifer, just one point here. Um, for many of us, the way into journalism was youth media. Right. And whether that was poetry or video or journalism programming, that was the way in. And Jennifer runs one of the more important programs in the country that helps to create those pipelines. But Jennifer, over to you. Hi, good morning. My name is Jennifer Steele, and I am the new executive director of A26 Shy, which is a nonprofit writing, tutoring, and publishing center, amplifying the voices of Chicago youth ages 6 to 18. So a lot of our work is deeply embedded in putting youth voice first and supporting young people in understanding their urgency and agency um, of their voice and all the different mediums in which they can apply uh, their stories and their experiences to the written word or communications as well. Um, and most recently, I served as the partnerships coordinator for Chicago Public Library's Teen Services Department, where um, I served its youth media program since its inception in 2009. So much of my work um, since graduating uh, grad school has been around youth arts education and arts entrepreneurship and developing the potential and the talent of young people across Chicago. Uh, fabulous. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn next to my colleague at the Seattle Times, Mary. Um, let's have you uh, come in here. Hey, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm happy to join this great group. Um, so I am fairly new to the Seattle Times. I started six months ago as part of the investigative team um, through the Investigative Journalism Fund, which is new at the Seattle Times. Um, and I came here from the Associated Press, where I covered um, a lot of Indian country stories and particularly law enforcement and the really unique situation that a lot of uh, Native communities face with different jurisdictions and different layers of policing and all those, the gaps that come with it. Um, in addition to having worked at AP, um, kind of in between different stints with the company. I also was the president of the Native American Journalists Association and um, had a chance there to like, really um, work towards inclusion and even just uh, found that that work for us was about even just awareness of our communities and um, our existence and the stories that um, we needed highlighted. So I'm Excited to maybe talk a little bit about reflections on that work and um, just really glad to be here. Great. Um, thank you, Mary. And I, I, specificity counts, right? So I think your, your direct input on what we could be doing better, what should be happening, um, and also lessons learned, right? I mean, this is not the beginning of a conversation about how to really transfer power to communities of color in journalism. We've been having a conversation for a long time. So uh, thanks for joining us and, and bringing that perspective. Uh, we're going to go next to Cheryl Duvall, 
Um, one of the greats in terms of public radio and podcasting, uh, I'm not even going to joke here, Cheryl, uh, you've delivered the goods uh, in many different shows in many different places. Um, I've had the benefit of our friendship and partnership for many years now. Um, but uh, Cheryl, would you introduce yourself before I start? You're like, I don't want to roast you here, but but it could go on. Good idea. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to be part of this conversation. Um, my name's Cheryl Duvall. I have worked in various media, um, including Black Weekly, in, um, daily mainstream newspapers, was a correspondent for NPR for a stretch of about 11 years, and have edited national programs, um, you know, national, nationally distributed radio programs. And um, for the last couple of years, I've hung out my shingle as what I like to call an independent word slinger. Um, I edit podcasts, radio series, I do some coaching, and um, I have been flashing back a lot in recent weeks around stories I've covered and how we got over, including the 1992 uprising in Los Angeles, and um, the kinds of ways that Black journalists and journalists of color do keep one another afloat. So let's talk about all that. All right, Cheryl. Well, um, thank you for being here. And I will just put a marker down that Cheryl and I, uh, about a year ago, worked on a podcast together with Cal Matters called Force the Law that followed um, an attempt in California state legislature to deal with police violence. Um, so if you haven't checked out that show, please do, because it's a very thorough uh, treatment of the issue as it stood about a year ago. Um, Aaliyah, I, I'm passing it to you now. Um, the only thing I will say again, just as Aaliyah has done some of the best reporting and education for sure, I think nationally, but has also been a critical part of the Mississippi Today team, which is one of the most important newsrooms in America, in my opinion. Um, but so many talents, Aaliyah. I look forward to hearing from you. I will, I'll, I'll be your wingman in this dialogue. Over to you, Aaliyah. Yes. Um, thank you again, Joaquin, for allowing me to be a part of this conversation, which I think is very necessary um, during this time right now. And I think to start off the conversation, I've been seeing a lot of a community of journalists rally around um, other journalists on social media during this time, um, which has been so beautiful to see, you know, that support and motivation. And so one of the questions I want to ask is, what do we need to support journalists of color in their work during this time? What's needed immediately? And then also, how do we sustain that support for them? And Tracy, I, I would love for you to start this conversation off with answering that question. Well, thank you, Aaliyah. Um, and that's an excellent question. Um, I think most immediately, um, we need to listen to journalists of color in our newsroom. That's the most important thing. Um, for so long, not only have the voices in the community been ignored, but voices inside these organizations, white led these organizations, have been ignored and dismissed. And so, if we can start there, um, I think there might be improvements made. Um, there are other things that we can certainly do um, in terms of hiring and recruiting at all levels of news organizations so that supports are there. Um, but as we both know, we are in a time where we are contracting and losing um, journalism positions and, and, and jobs. So I'm not sure how realistic that is, that is going to be um, in terms of hiring. I would like to see it, but I'm not confident that we're going to see it. Um, in terms of, um, I think that we need to not only listen to each other and listen to journalists of color in the newsroom, but we need to be sure to provide some emotional and some support there that, you know, we, you know, for too long, we've taken for granted, making sure that, you know, 
folks have people to talk to, making sure that they're taking the, the time off and backing away and, and making sure we recognize that, um, making sure that, you know, as youth leaders, we're spreading kind of the responsibilities around throughout the news organizations. We're not just putting Black reporters on the beat of covering protests or covering Black communities. That kind of stuff can't happen anymore. So, you know, we need to spread it around and make sure that everybody is doing their part in terms of covering the communities that we say we serve. Um, in order to get other voices in on this question, I want to just end, end here real quick. In terms of sustainability, I don't know. I think the verdict is still out on whether this is going to be sustained or not. Um, I think a lot of what I'm seeing is performative, and I just don't have the confidence that it's going to continue. I, you know, that won't go back and fall back on bad habits. So I think that is a question that, that you know, all of us in this audience and these rooms across the country are going to have to discuss how do we make this sustainable. I, I have no idea right now, and I'm not even sure that it will be. So I'll just end it right there. Yeah, Cheryl. I'm sorry I, to end on such a negative note. I don't want to be in negatively. I just, I, my confidence is not there. That's all. No, thank you for sharing. And Cheryl, I saw you nod on a couple of those points that Tracy mentioned. I would love to hear your thoughts about the same question. Well, a good example of what support means is something that probably most of y'all in, in this have seen, and that is the 1619 Project out of the New York Times. That is that was the brainchild of a single journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and the Times put its institutional weight behind this project. Um, about 15 years before, the same institution attempted to cover race as it is lived in the United States. It, that won a Pulitzer, too, and it certainly involved a lot of journalists um, from the staff. The difference in tone and in intention between those two um, projects, 15 or so years apart, says a lot about the extent to which Black journalists in this instance could really steer the ship. A critical mass of people within that news organization had achieved leadership um, status and visibility. And so that raises the, oh, and, and the, and the project was successful <coughs> beyond belief, and I'm not just talking about ad sales or subscriptions, although they had to do additional print runs so that people could get it. The reason I bring that up is that even at the, even at, uh, at the local level, you know, even when it's a small organization, it counts when leadership listens, when Black people, when Native people, Latinx people are, feel it's possible to suggest an idea and know that the institution will listen and respond and not shoot it down out of hand. I think all of us on this panel have had the experience of being told no. And no in itself isn't bad. Sometimes you have to go back and rethink an idea. But of also just being dismissed out of hand, no follow through, not taken seriously on stories big and small. And that limits the coverage of yeah, I mean, that limits the scope of, of these organizations. I could go on for a while about times the limitation has happened to me, but 
I just wanted to offer that support, I mean, you know, what support looks like, um, you know, in a way that all of us pretty much have seen. And I'm glad you started to talk about those points, Cheryl, because that kind of pivots into my next question of really defining what role and responsibility do news organizations and funders have in supporting Black journalists? And I don't know if, Tracy, you want to kind of expound a little bit more here, or Cheryl, I would love to kind of hear more about that. So what role do funders have in supporting Black journalists and journalists of color? Has, that role has been um, re really limited and restricted to, um, I would say, kind of like people who have, they have dubbed as superstars in the past. You know, so there are the ones, the handful, the few that were able to make it to like star, star status was supported by these, you know, by funders and the news organizations themselves, really. Um, what the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund is doing is saying uh, we're democratizing that and we only support news organizations led by and for people of color. I want to repeat that because a lot of times these white-led news organizations, they might cover communities of color or Black communities, but it's for a white state. It's reporting about these others out there that they really have no understanding and are, are not in relationship with. So I would, you know, this fund kind of like takes that on its head and says, okay, we're not just talking about the news or investing in these organizations that write about and report about communities of color. We want to, them to, we want to invest in organizations that report for these communities, for um, the communities they, 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 they serve. So um, that is, in my opinion, that's the responsibility of funders, that especially as so many uh, dollars in the in the industry now are now are now nonprofit dollars. We have a responsibility to support communities, um, particularly communities that have been underserved and underappreciated and underrecognized for years. Um, so those in the organizations that the racial equity and journalism fund supports, um, I think, in terms of you know white lit news organizations, we're still kind of stuck in that role of okay, trying to understand these communities, trying to help other white people understand people of color. And, you know, maybe that's their role. I don't know. Maybe that's where, what they do best to let them do it. But in terms of what nonprofit dollars should be funding right now, we need funding using information for the communities. We use the information that they can use to make the best decisions about how they need, to want, need and want to live their lives. That, I believe, is our responsibility right now as nonprofit funders of journalism. Cheryl, did you want to add anything? Only that um, organizations exist that have helped journalists of color along. I mean, I'm thinking about National Association of Hispanic Journalists, Native American Journalists Association, Asian American Journalists Association, and the oldest of them, National Association of Black Journalists. And in many newsrooms over many years, again, the journalists who participate in this have this tug of war with their management or they just decide, screw it, I'll go, I'll pay my own way to the convention. Um, when upper management wants to send a bunch of people to other journalism conferences or skills conferences like um, investigative reporters and editors, that they don't get questioned in the same way that a request from me to attend National Association of Black Journalists might happen. The Environmental Journalists Association doesn't, doesn't put people, or the idea of attending that conference, oh, that's skills building. Oh, that's networking. Oh, that's a way to show our commitment to that level of coverage. But 
um, again, it's one of those ways in which um, our power within newsrooms is limited. Similarly, when it comes to participating in training, um, not every manager is terribly interested in having a reporter or editor or photographer go and participate in um, the programs that exist to bring younger journalists along, um, you know, like Next Generation Radio Project out of NPR. Um, it becomes a tug of war that really um, limits the, it downplays the importance of bringing people along. Not everybody can do an unpaid internship. And there is a very lively debate right now within journalism about who gets in, who doesn't, because of what they can afford to do during their summers. Um, I'd love to hear what other panelists have to say. Yeah, Mary, I would love to, to throw it to you as, you know, a journalist who's on the ground, who's doing this work. You know, Cheryl and Tracy mentioned a, a, a couple of things about, you know, being able to listen to journalists in the newsroom and making sure those voices are included in the coverage. For you, what is it that you need beyond, you know, some of these things they've mentioned as a journalist doing this work? Um. I've been thinking about the newsroom a lot lately, um, having worked in a few. And um, I think what is needed in this moment, maybe most of all, as far as the, the um, assertion of a comment about support from Tracy, is the um, like ability to, and the willingness from from news managers to not only make the decision to reflect on their privilege um, and their their approach to news over the years, as far as um, raising up voices in communities of color, um, and also listening to the ideas of journalists of color in the newsroom and deciding not a and deciding a not to shoot them down, but also to really sit with the ideas that they're bringing forward um, before moving on, you know, to the next subject. I, um, but I also have thought about, I think that's work that news managers can do right now to support journalists of color. Um, and I don't think that it's expensive. I think that there's work that needs to still be done and has been done in the past and dropped um, at different points because of funding. Um, and that's investing at very early levels or early stages for young journalists. Um, and so now we're at this moment where it's going to be hard to do that. And I think because of the state of the economy, and I think that's, um, you know, I think that's really unfortunate. And I think that's a huge reality check for the news industry that we've arrived here at a place where there's never been a time, well, there's always been a time when journalists of color is stories and ideas are extremely important, but they're, they're needed right now. And there's, um, they should, they should be centered now. They should be centered all the time, but especially now. Um, and a lot of the investment, um, in talent and the pipeline has, has only has been spotty at best. So. So with that being said, Mary, can you talk about what are some of, we know we're experienced what Aaron Haynes, excuse me, says a pandemic within a pandemic. Um, but can you talk a little bit more specifically about some of the issues that you've been covering during this time? And while covering that, what support have you gotten or what support you wish you would have gotten in doing it? Um. I feel like in this time, a lot of my coverage has still been around the news. Um, so with the pandemic, it's been um, very much like nursing homes in the Seattle area and also um, 
the protests themselves. Um, I think, and this is not just speaking for me, but um, I think maybe the support that journalists of color and, and all allies are maybe going to be hoping for even more as the news cycles continue is a chance for the discussions around the underlying issues, um, the inequities that have been there all along that have, uh, have, are, are the underpinnings of this moment for us. Um, and stories that maybe some news outlets have covered really well, but um, maybe work that not all newsrooms have done, have done as much as they should have before we arrived here to help um, the country understand where we are. So I think um, opportunities to really start to develop those ideas about inequities and inequality. Oh, you've mentioned oh, a number of things. I love it. Um, <laughs> and I have to pivot to Jennifer, because I really would love to hear this. Mary mentioned, you know, this pipeline issue um, and this young talent um, issue. And I would love to, for Jennifer, you to talk about your work with working with you, but youth, but also how do you center young voices um, in this coverage? And also um, how can news organizations center youth voices within coverage? Yeah, um, I think within this time, it's been really, really interesting. So our work has always been around uh, centering youth voice. So everything we do, youth are at the center of it, um, everything we design. Um, and we've just released a publication, Chaos Comes Naturally, from a group of seniors from George Washington High School, which is a really incredible print and Google Earth publication. And it was really around um, how they feel or how they understand how they belong within the, within the city of Chicago. And it was really a counter narrative to this idea that there are so many stories being told about Chicago, but that are not relevant or reflective of their experiences as youth. Um, and so one thing we're also particularly this time trying to think about is how do we balance and create space for young people who have something to say within this moment, but also honoring where they are in this moment and not requiring them to produce work in response to the moment too. Um, so I think in terms of how how media and how newsrooms can really center youth voice, I think there's so many, you know, um, organizations who have been working with youth and who are working on with them to um, tell their stories and reflect their narratives and create these platforms by just plugging in to the work that's being done in the communities as well and really understanding how I think to the point of being made really sourcing the content and the stories from the people within the communities that you know one seeks to report about. Um, I think being able to just create space and, and for us it's always about being intentional. Um, it's, it's being intentional about we are going to create space for young people in this time. Um, and then once you make that decision that that's what you're going to do, I believe the steps fall in place and understanding, okay, you know, who are the organizations, who are you serving organizations in these communities? Who do we then contact? But I think that very first step is just making it an intentional act that you're going to include young people's voices in the platforms and medias that you have accessible to you. Yeah. I, you mentioned, you know, creating space and making sure that the communities that you're covering are um, being included in that. And so what does that look like? Yeah, so I would say, um, so with us being a publishing organization, so if it's a matter of you have a print publication, you know, so being able to work with young people or having, um, like working, let's say like you're working with 826Shy and you know that we're working on a set of stories is in creating intentional partnerships with youth organizations and saying, okay, we are going to place this space within our print publication. We are going to work with this partner. We are going to source this content from the organization and we're going to create space here. 
or we're going to create a video segment. Um, we're going to create, so all those tangible media artifacts that can be published on a platform, it's just making the intentional partnership. It's like, we're going to create the space, then we're going to create this partnership. And we know we're going to be working with people who know how to work with youth and develop their writing and just really making your platforms open and just creating that space for the content to live in those platforms. I've heard of, oh, I'm trying to figure Aaliyah. out. What I'm Hold on, Aaliyah, I got to get in here on that one. Okay. Mind <laughs> if I just do a double click? So um, uh, what Jennifer just said, I think is this, this is not like a, an opinion, it's an instruction manual, right? <laughs> of building direct, mm -hmm. equal, and productive mm -hmm. relationships with community-based organizations. They exist, they do this work. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. What Jennifer is doing is supporting a new generation of writers and documentary um, uh, uh, essayists and journalists, frankly. Mm -hmm. Now, they need jobs mm -hmm. when they get through this. They need help in college. They need money. Um, all of that is the instruction manual for how to do this. And I just want to cite one quick example, and then I'll turn it back to you, Aaliyah. The Sacramento Bee started working in partnership with a community organization, Soul Collective. And there were two documentary filmmakers within that group. Um, who were out commissioned by them as freelancers to cover the protests. They got arrested. Of course, they got targeted and arrested. They had their press pass. They had their credentials. The cops did not believe them until they pulled out the managing editor's business card and they were like, call them, right? So that's where it hit the rubber hits the road on this is that you can't just go to people uh, when you think you need to check a box. It has to be a real relationship built over time. And that has to be two ways, right? And, and I would say for 826, and they're in 10 different cities around the country, those are built up organizations with very, very senior and savvy leadership like Jennifer. So, all right, I'm gonna be quiet now. Back to you, Aaliyah. No, thank but you. But Joaquin, can I, can I also pitch in right there real quick? Cause I think it is very important, Aaliyah. Um, so in 1968, before I think all of us were born, there was a Kerner Commission report that came out that said exactly what we're, they talked about exactly what we're talking about right now that news organizations needed to hire people, that they need to work in the communities, that they need to build relationships in the communities. That happened in 1968. And news organizations had this manual that Joaquin is talking about. They, they still have the <laughs> manual. They're just not following it. And so as a result, um, the same issues that have, were happening back in 1968 are happening now. We're still talking about some of the same issues, some of the same stuff. We're still talking about hiring and all this, all this other stuff with the same conversations happening. We have the manual, we need to follow it. But I want to throw this out to the panel. Is it too late? Because we don't have relationships with the community. Not only do communities of color not trust us, nobody trusts us right now. And when I say us, I'm talking about Dick J journalism. People don't trust us because we don't have relationships with them. So what I would what I would suggest and encourage and what I am encouraging now is that because big J journalism organizations don't have relationships with communities of color, with communities period, that we partner and collaborate with those who do. Everybody on this panel, I want to call your attention to. There's a reason, there's a reason that um, Jennifer Steele went out and started something herself. There's a reason that Mary Huddett was or was or is a former president of the Native American Journalists Association. There's a reason that she tapped into that. There is a reason that I created my own and I left the I left the white led news organization. Um, there's a reason Cheryl has independent in her title. There's a reason we left or we started our own things for a reason. There's a reason Aaliyah has, you know, the Mississippi Today, which is a startup. There's a reason behind all of that. And I think it has to, and you can, I welcome your responses. I think it has to do with the fact that we couldn't create and innovate within the organizations where we were at. So we had to go out, go, go elsewhere to do that. And because we've done that, the news organizations that now seek to want to have relationships or they say they want relationships with the community, perhaps you should consider partnering with those of us who do. Yeah, I'd like to actually touch upon that because I think that's 
really important. And as I've been listening to you all speak and some of the things that have been coming to mind to that point about creating something. Um, so when I started a team led publishing house, um, I was just excited to work with any, you know, like young people about Chicago. What ended up happening is that my, my entire teen editorial staff, which is five youth from different parts of the city, were all young people of color. And, and so in that moment, it became so apparent. It's like, you know, it kind of inherently, but to see it physically in front of you, is like, this is what we need. There needs to be more, you know, education and pipelines for young people. First, like, I just want young people to know that if you like writing and reading, you can be an editor, right? Like that's a, that is a career path that you can take and how we're teaching that and engaging young people in that, but really understanding about there are not enough positions or young or people of color or black people in positions of editorial positions right and so that's kind of what i recognize in that work is like there's not an, they, one there's not enough representation in these specific types of role and there's not enough education around that being a viable possibility right so i think to that point about um just really understanding why we had to create space so that we so i don't think it's too late but i think it's about being that intentional even if it means starting with the young people we have now right who are still learning and processing and how we in our positions where we are not advocate to create space so when they are ready to emerge into those spaces that those spaces are there and ready for them to take their leadership positions i'd like to jump in um to add something that we're all aware of the business model for mainstream journalism is broken. We've all talked about it. We are aware of it. News organizations are laying off massive numbers of people. Um, you know, I don't have the statistic right at hand, but like a third of the journalists who were working um, a mere 10 years ago aren't in the business anymore. And one thing we haven't spoken enough about it nearly enough is that that business model was predicated on not always but generally predicated on treating audiences as consumers and not as civic actors and I use that term instead of citizens because not everyone is a citizen, but there are ways to engage people and to do journalism with a public service mandate that shareholder interest doesn't mesh very well with. I mean, it's one of the reasons I keep going back to the devil I know, nonprofit media. Mississippi Today is a nonprofit. Um, that's not perfect, but black radio, except in a very few in a very few instances, like WVON in Chicago, does not emphasize. Um, opinion does not emphasize reporting and current affairs, you know, um, and yet the potential to reach people and to really mix it up and engage, especially on social media platforms is huge. But the model that journalism has been working under in this country hasn't been nimble enough, hasn't been responsive, hasn't listened enough, and has been so concentrated on selling that it's lost track of the necessity of equipping people with the information they need to make up their minds. Some people get it. I'll, you know, the Wall Street Journal can fill you in on business trends. The New York Times has made a beat of getting your kid into an Ivy League school. But there are an awful lot of other needs that mainstream journalism doesn't quite want to address. So 
So how do we engage more diverse audiences? How do nonprofit news organizations do that? How can, you know, traditional journalism outlets do that? Um, Tracy, if you want to give your thoughts to that question. Thank you. So, yeah, as I was saying earlier, there are, there are uh, news organizations out there who are already um, existing and in relationship with these communities. I think you have to partner and collaborate with those existing news organizations, um, whether it's Black audiences, immigrant audiences, youth audiences, they exist. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us out here. I'm only able to fund at this time 19, but there are hundreds of them out here. And so you have to partner and collaborate with those news organizations. Um, you need to also pay them for that, you know, that you have to, you know, just can't extract that inf information for free. Also, um, and I, I would love to get feedback on this. I think we need to, to radically reimagine journalism. Um, we need to rethink what journalism is, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, what it sounds like. Um, there are news organizations, and, and I, I want to throw this to, to Jennifer. Um, instead of trying to remake journalism in the image of white folks, <laughs> we need to allow the community and put the community to tell us what journalism is to them. What, is, what does that mean? What does that look like to them? And allow that kind of feedback and communication. Um, and so I would love to hear Jennifer's thoughts on this because I've been thinking about this a lot in mm -hmm. terms of how we define journalism and why it's not working. Um, and why we need to listen to other to our, to our communities and let them help us define it. Yeah, I mean, I, that's really interesting. And I think kind of to the points that have been made about sourcing from the communities, we have so many wonderful community um, newspapers, you know, that are reflecting the stories that are happening within individual communities. So I think partnering with those um, with those sources is one way, but I sometimes think about it, it's like how often do we ask people within their community for their stories, you know? And I think that's one of the things that our young people in our programs are often, um, why they're so drawn to um, learning to write and learning to write with us is because we value and we, we value their stories, but we affirm their stories and we make space for their stories and there's room for all stories. Um, so I think really it's it's just about affirming that there are all these stories that need to be reflected, just asking, you know, like I think it's just going to the communities, going to people in their communities and asking them for their stories and getting their perspective um, on their communities or things that are important to them. And also understanding that as mainstream media, what we think is important to a community to be reporting and what is actually important for them to be community um, within their communities and outside of their communities um, as well. Mary, so I would does love that mean that our standards are different? Does that mean that we don't have the same the same journalistic standards? Because I don't think so. I think we still have those same standards. Mm -hmm. But what I mean, I'm just trying to get at what does that what does that look like for, for folks who yeah. might be having a I'm little trouble? I'm that the power okay. dynamic has to be mm -hmm. different. Right. It isn't just we come and talk to you. And, you know, commit what I call drive-by journalism, namely right. showing up and sticking our mic in the face of the grieving mother whose son has just been shot and never going back to that area. Mm -hmm. But understanding that journalism as practiced has been kind of an extractive industry. Mm -hmm. And instead of going and showing up only when something terrible is happening. Learning to be humble, learning to listen, learning to abide with and be open to suggestions, story ideas, criticism, you name it. Yeah, and I think it's a question of, you know, for me, it's go back to, it goes back to the question of who gets to be a journalist, right? What are the credentials or criteria for you to be able to tell a story um, of your community or of your experiences, or of your community's collective experience? Um, how do we define who gets to tell that story and why do they specifically 
get to the, tell that story. And I'm glad you brought up that point about the drive-by um, reporting. And I think that's, re that's really important too, because I think to your point about, right, it's like we shouldn't be calling on communities of color or journalists of color only in these types of moments of crisis, but reflecting on all the varied stories that deserve to be told and deserve to make the news. Mayor, I would love to get your feedback on this. What does community engagement look like for you in the Seattle Times? Um, I was going to point out that that question kind of struck me um, only because it, it came after the question of like whether it's too late. Um, I don't think it's too late. I think um, that we can't really afford to, to think that it is um, it engaging communities and doing the work that's needed, but it is, it is a tough time. Um, it's especially tough now to, with like um, stay at home restrictions that have gone on and all the care we need to take around um, the virus. Um, it's, it's especially difficult now to engage with, um, with communities. And I'm new to the city, so maybe I'm feeling that much more profoundly. It's, it's hard to build sources and connect um, with communities in the way that I've always known how to do it, which is in person. Um, but that said, I think that the work starts now for me at the Seattle Times um, in this opportunity to, to do these stories um, about issues with police, um, especially with marginalized communities and black community uh, in the city and um, to sustain those relationships and to understand that each interview I'm having the opportunity to get um, shouldn't be seen as, um, as, as a one-time thing, that it's, it's an opportunity to start building relationships. Um, so, I mean, that's my perspective from the reporter level. Um, from the, from the, publication like tier of it all um I, I think that this is something that I don't have an answer to but I do think that we as journalists and as news groups or newsrooms have to find a way to show um especially the, the leadership um now to show that we're, we're trying to do the work on ourselves to be better too. Um, and I, I don't know how, to, I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but, um, but I think that needs to be a question that's explored. Thank you. Um, and I know we're running out of time, so I would love to hear reflections from each one of you. And if you can throw in there, what does self-care look like for you during this time? Um, and I guess I'll start with Jennifer and then we can pass it to Cheryl, Mary, and then Tracy. Yeah, I've really appreciated this conversation and it was, it's was it been wonderful to kind of hear similar thoughts to have been rattling around in my head, even more so these past two weeks. And as we think about um, our work with young people and the work we're gonna continue to do and work that, how this can in, inform as we move forward um, doubling down on the work that we're doing at 826 Shy. Um, and then also in terms of like my self care, uh, I don't know, like I've been watching movies with my son. <laughs> so we've gotten very much into Steven Universe. So I'm now a new fan of that show. Um, but just really spending time with uh, my son and doing a lot of biking and being outside as much as possible. <laughs> Cheryl, you want to jump Cheryl. in? Cheryl! Um... Black Twitter, <laughs> I, you know, just having access, especially in this, you know, shelter at home time, to what a lot of folks are saying. Um, it's not an echo chamber. There are a lot of opinions and perspectives on what's going on at this moment. And I am not a digital native, you know. Um, I still write letters with pen and ink and stamps, Gwen Eiffel stamps, you know. But putting, being able to just dial into 
the continuing conversation about what's going on in newsrooms, what kinds of analyses people are coming up with, even the every now the the shared laugh um, has been a real support, you know, and it's also a wonderful tool for outreach. And that's you know that Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, t um, TikTok. My lord, you know, people are doing some incredibly fun things and smart ways of communicating that also any one of us can tap into to help build sources, to help build relationships, to help um, hear about or expose stories that we ought to know. But I've, you know, I found myself spending good time, you know, just appreciating all the brilliance um there is in a really direct way through social media mary uh, definitely going outside is one of them um but also i think um it's, it's been i think one of the hardest i'll say the hardest thing um has been not being in the newsroom and seeing other women and journalists of color in the newsroom and just to have the chance to have really like natural conversations about ideas and now those things have to be scheduled um through zoom or a little, there's a little bit more extra effort that needs to take place for that and so i would say that for sure is the the effort to reach out to coworkers and to just have a chance to chat with them um, and to, for it to be casual and informal, talk about ideas. And Tracy. You're on mute, Tracy. She's just practicing the mute button. I see, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so this is going to sound really weird coming from a journalist. Um, I'm going to start with to answer your second question first in terms of self-care. So be ready. We have to unplug, turn off the news, pull away from the news in order to take care of ourselves. It gets to be a lot. So we need to just tune it out, go for a walk, do some breathing exercises, you know, spend time with, time with the kids, but really focus on what's important and kind of tune out of the new, the 24 hour news cycle is overwhelming, not only to um, the public, but to us as journalists. So I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of self care. And because I think I've asked a lot of provocative questions instead of some provocative things, I hope during this session, I'm going to try to really end on a positive note. I went all the way back to 19. In the Kerner Report and how that gives us instruction um, for what we really should be doing now. But that report also talked about the foot soldiers in journalism. Those were members of the Black press and the Hispanic press who are out there on the ground reporting on the news um, every day, day in and day out. It has been eye-opening to see sort of the rebellion happening, happening in white lit news organizations across this country. Um, editors having to step down or being removed, um, that has been eye-opening. But at the same time, we continue to see the business model of journalism shrink the ranks of journalists. And I just want to give hope to folks who are being laid off and furloughed. You are still foot soldiers. There are still opportunities to practice the craft and to do good journalism. The, the cost to start up your own news sites are lower now than ever before. And you can do that. And there are nonprofit dollars, more nonprofit dollars flowing in, into this sector now than ever before that can support some of that independent journalism that is needed and wanted by our community. So I lay it there. Continue to be the foot soldiers. Con continue to, to do good journalism, even as our new board, our white, news, white said news organizations struggle in this time. This is indeed a moment and a movement for our country. 
whether it's a movement for journalism, I guess we'll find out. And thank you again for having me. Uh, well, I just want to thank Aaliyah also for amazing moderation. Aaliyah, thank you so much. And um, uh, just in closing, a couple of quick notes, folks. Um, uh, this was not a hard conversation to pull off other than making a few phone calls, but I know it's hard to, to, to have the courage to just say everything we got to say out loud. So I thank every panelist for being frank and being charming at the same time. Um, and I know we're going into Martin's session after this quick break, but it, just as somebody from Oakland, I want to point out two quick things. Um, the Maynard Institute is named after somebody who stood up, and his daughter Dory also stood up, and Martin and Evelyn are standing up. And so um, please work with them, be a part of that. Um, and also, it meant something in Oakland. So we're in a cycle where we're responding to police violence right now. Um, and this, this current uh, generation of it has some anchors in Oakland also with, um, with the, the shooting and the murder of Oscar Grant. Um, but his mom, Wanda Johnson, if you have not seen what she's done since she lost her son, it's instructive. She created an organization to support other families that have gone through this. She educates people about how to respond. She practices and builds capacity around self-care so people can sustain the energy of what she refers to as mothers of the movement. And so Wanda did not go silently into the night and just get sourced in some news stories when her son was lost. Wanda, to me, is a hero because she continues to stay on this issue. So um, they're not hard to find. They're out there. Um, and they're not waiting for you to cover them. They're doing the work. So I appreciate everybody who helped to make this space. Um, we have a lot of work to do, obviously. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back over to Jonathan. Thank you very much. <laughs>